atheism is, I think, appealed to me because it seemed very much to be the choice of the kind of of intellectuals, as far as I understood it. The more that I read, the more I realised that I had actually dismissed the entire Christian tradition. I thought that I understood. I thought that I knew. I sort of reduced Christianity, as many of us do, I think, in the contemporary West, to a series of kind of very basic kind of doctrines or propositions and think that it is just this kind of simplistic series of beliefs. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. Well, I am absolutely delighted to be joined today by Associate Professor Dr. Sarah Irving Stonebreaker, who is an Australian-based academic focusing on the history of Britain and the colonial world, particularly the intersection of religion, science and politics. Sarah is the author of the award-winning Natural Science and the Origins of the British Empire, and she's got a very exciting upcoming book, Priests of History, Engaging with the Past in an Ahistoric Age. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Ruth. Well, I'm so excited to hear more about your incredible book, Priests of History. We're going to be talking about that on another episode. But what I'd love to talk to you today um, is, is just a bit of your story as you tell it in Coming to Faith Through Dawkins, because you have such an interesting journey. And I'd love to go, if you don't mind, Sarah, can we maybe just go right back to the beginning? I mean, what was your experience of God, of religion, of these big questions of life as a young child? Yes, well, I actually grew up in a non-Christian family. Um, It was a very secular family. And so I actually didn't really know much about God or about Christianity at all. Um, And in fact, I, I felt like I really didn't need God, as it were, because I felt like I had a fairly firm sense of my own identity and I sort of felt like I knew what life was all about um, and therefore that I didn't need God because I sort of thought about God in terms of, well, um, why, why would I need him if I know who I am and what life is all about? Um, and, yeah, and for the most part, I think it's because I was the kind of person, I was very sort of academic, uh, scholarly child, and I had this dream from when I was a child that one day I would go and study at Oxford or Cambridge. And so that kind of academic drive and that kind of sense that, well, life's about kind of just fulfilling these kind of academic ambitions meant that I kind of just uh, never really took seriously, to be honest, the claims of Christianity. And so did you kind of look at different religions and then decide on atheism or was it more just that was kind of where you were already sat and and you thought, actually, this is this is a good place to be? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, Actually, atheism is I think appealed to me because it seemed very much to be the choice of the kind of of intellectuals as far as I understood it. Um, atheism seemed to be, or kind of secular humanist atheism, seemed to be the kind of natural choice of somebody who, and this was the kind of, it, it is actually really quite crude, but the kind of, one of the myths I think that we have about the modern world was one which I to which I subscribed, which is that really, um, modernity and reason and progress have sort of emerged in such a way that they um, emancipated themselves from the shackles of religion. And therefore, as somebody who was intellectual, um, Christianity was something that I would dispense with too. And therefore, atheism, secular humanism seemed like a kind of natural choice. Well, and you did end up going to both Cambridge and Oxford, so <laughs> well done you. Um, and while you were there, you were studying the work of natural philosophers such as Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke, and they began to challenge some of your assumptions, didn't they? Would you just say a little bit about what studying them sort of meant for you and how it kind of slightly unsettled you? Yeah, this was really quite fascinating. Um, so, I was uh, studying for my PhD thesis at the University of Cambridge, and um, really the topic was about the relationship between um, the origins of what we would now call it natural science, so I studied natural philosophers, as they were called in the 17th century, and the British Empire. And so I was studying um, people who, are, some of whom are quite well known today, um, among whom are people like Robert Boyle, the founder of modern chemistry in many ways. And the interesting thing is that Boyle in his work, the more I read of Boyle's work, the more he seemed to be talking about theology in the very same texts that he was talking about why he actually studied the natural world. Um, Boyle quoted the scriptures, um, was 
particularly in, engrossed with this kind of idea about um, what it meant to kind of steward God's creation well. Talked a lot about the, um, the Genesis idea in chapter one that humanity is kind of given this responsibility to have dominion or stewardship over the earth and that this framed his idea of the natural sciences. Um, and then I came across Robert Hooke, who in the preface of his work Micrographia, which is really one of the formative texts on um, the origins of the microscope and so significant too for using the microscope as part of the experimental method. And yet in that text, Hooke too does a similar kind of thing. Um, here's a text about the microscope and yet what it's talking about is actually and here's an interesting thing, that the microscope is in many ways a, an attempt to kind of repair the effects of sin in the fall on the human senses. And so what Hooke actually explains in the preface to that text is that actually the use of the microscope helps to kind of, um, as a kind of reparation of the damage that sin in the moment of the fall wrecked not only upon our moral, obviously we understand the fall as a kind of a, a moment of a moral turning away from God, but Cook and others had this sense that actually sin affected our cognitive capacities, our, our intellect, our reason, but also our senses. And so here's Hawke writing a text about the microscope and is talking about it in theological terms as a kind of attempt to repair the effects of the fall on human senses. So actually what Hawke thinks is that what we see through the microscope on a microscopic level is a far is sort of an approximation of what Adam and Eve would have been able to see with their plate, with their sort of naked eyes before the fall. And so that made me um, think twice about Christianity, um, at least about a kind of, at least about a kind of assumption that I'd always had about Christianity and science, which is a kind of a natural one in many ways for somebody in the late, nearly 21st century, late 20th century, early 21st century which is that science and religion have nothing to do with each other. And so while it didn't make me a Christian, as it were, it I think it did help to set me on a path of having to take seriously the fact that, no, no, actually, in the past, intellects, including um, some of the founders of modern science, took their faith enormously seriously. And I think that was the moment at Cambridge when I realised I might have to at least take Christianity seriously too, or at least not dismiss it in the way that, to be honest, I really had. Well, and, and you know, you've touched on a, a key point that actually lots and lots of atheists would just assume to be true, that religion and science are not compatible. Do you know why you had taken on that assumption? Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I think in many ways that's that kind of assumption is part of the story that culture, contemporary culture, but really in many ways the kind of culture of the kind of um, the Western world has told itself since the Enlightenment. There's been this kind of um, story that the modern world has emerged, as I kind of alluded to earlier, has a kind of has emerged from the shackles of kind of religion and tradition and authority, and that science is very much part of that that modern kind of orientation towards the world and towards progress. And so I think personally that was why I'd sort of it was an unstated assumption in many ways because it was part of the kind of cultural water that I swam in, as it were. And you, you said in this book, Coming to Faith Through Dawkins, that studying the work of the natural philosophers like Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke began to um, really challenge some of your assumptions. And, and you say of studying them that the epistemology and the methodology of experiment, it turned out, were in fact made possible by a Christian view of knowledge. I mean, that must have been quite earth shattering as an atheist. How did that make you feel to think that actually so much of this underpinning of these philosophers, these scientists, was in fact Christian? To be honest, it raises questions that bring to mind your own orientation toward knowledge. Yeah. Um, and they're things that you just can't dismiss. And I think there were there were questions that I couldn't answer at that moment when I was in Cambridge or for the next couple of years, but things really began to, um, I suppose there was another kind of step, as it were, in that story when I arrived at Oxford um, a year or, or two later, sort of as I was or after I'd finished my PhD, actually. Um, and then those questions really kind of came to the fore in a new way. Because um, what happened there is that, uh, so Peter Singer, the famous uh, atheist philosopher, came to give a, this sort of the You're Hero lectures on ethics at Oxford. And um, a number of my friends and I went to go and hear Singer. 
um, which was a great experience. I was particularly excited seeing as an Australian, so it was kind of thrilling to hear his Australian accent um, in the middle of Oxford. And But actually what happened in those lectures was that even more of my kind of assumptions, secular kind of humanist assumptions about the world were shown to just be um, really kind of impoverished in the sense that what what Singer dealt with in those lectures in many ways was the, was the question of human value. This is something that Singer deals with elsewhere in his work as well, and that was something that I went and, and read about. But Singer's dealing with this idea that, well, because he is an atheist, there is no inherent worth in human life. Um, and therefore, that kind of the idea that all human beings are of equal moral worth and of inherent kind of worth is, as he calls it, a kind of Christian myth. That's something we need to dispense with. And so Singer puts forward a very different utilitarian kind of understanding of ethics. But what happened was that I left those lectures with a kind of profound intellectual vertigo because what I kind of assumed were sort of self-evident truths, um, it turns out weren't actually sustained by atheism at all because as Singer quite reasonably points out, and it's in, it's entirely entirely the case, that no, to actually believe that every human life is of equal moral worth uh, presupposes that you have this kind of view of the kind of of the uniqueness and preciousness of human life, which has historically just been given to us from Christianity. It's not actually a view that atheism can sustain. Um, and indeed, you know, if you look at the natural world, there is a vast hierarchy of of talents and of capacities and lack of capacities, intellectual and um, so forth. And so actually, if the natural world is the ultimate reality, then building a system of ethics that somehow honours the innate and equal dignity of human life simply doesn't work. So that that kind of moment, um, which I went to those lectures and came home and talked about this with a number of my friends um, and started kind of reading more about atheism, mm. again, it kind of it made me realize that I that a that atheism couldn't sustain my deepest moral commitments, um, and that secondly, the fact that those commitments were inherited from the Christian intellectual tradition was something that I would need to actually take seriously. So this is look, this is a, I'm kind of condensing a bit of a story here, but um, yeah, it's another significant moment, I guess. Yeah. Well, because there's a really key moment in the book where you say that Singer's belief that not all human beings are of equal worth alarmed me, but soon I began to question why I was alarmed. And I suppose that's the key thing, isn't it? It's one thing to be alarmed that, you know, if you kind of push your atheistic beliefs to the logical conclusion, this is what happens. But then to be alarmed by that, that unsettles you and, and obviously began you, you started on a journey of trying to figure out why you were alarmed. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Um, but I, but I, but the point is that, that I was, and I couldn't make sense of why I would be alarmed if, as it were, that, if it were unproblematic that that atheist view of the universe and of the ultimate character of nature and humanity were actually true. That's right. Yeah. Well, let's just rewind back a little bit because it was the kind of the science religion thing that was like the first block, wasn't it? Then it was the Peter Singer yep. morals and virtue and, and human dignity. But just going back, I mean, this this book coming to faith through Dawkins, like obviously Richard Dawkins, whether you were like a huge fan or not, obviously his kind of philosophy and the atheistic worldview had had definitely, you know, that was kind of the landscape within which that you were working in. And you quote um, something from The God delusion which i'm sure lots of atheists would would definitely adhere to and um, where he says it's a tedious cliche and unlike many cliches it's not even true that science <laughs> concerns itself with the how questions and only theology is equipped to answer the why questions now do you have any idea why he didn't think that was true why it wasn't that because i guess that's like the sort of christian pat answer isn't it that science and and um religion can go together because one answers how and one answers why but why do you know why dawkins and the other new atheists think that that is not the case yeah, look, this is it's interesting because Dawkins over the years has made a number of different claims and at and, and at times actually there there are statements that he makes that seem to be quite incompatible with one another. 
Um, and I think if, you know, if one were a kind of a, a sort of scholar of Dawkins' work, we could probably tease this out in a little bit more detail. But it's probably just worth noting, though, that um, that at times, you know, Dawkins seems to claim that um, that there ought to be no particular uh, – that, he, that he's okay – about living in the kind of moral universe in which there is at bottom, to paraphrase that very famous quote from him, no evil would, and no good and so forth, no objective moral truths. Um, and yet at other times says things that are quite at odds with that, where he actually quite openly um, says that he wouldn't want to live in that kind of a universe. <laughs> and of course, he makes various moralizing claims, including that um, you know he opposes what he calls the kind of indoctrination um, of religion um, and the sort of the claims he makes about it being child abuse, so forth, which of course are very moral claims. So I think um, it's probably reasonable to point out that Dawkins himself seems to be, um, at least over time, he's been fairly conflicted about his own kind of position on these things. He's not, um, his background is not philosophy, so. So you had the kind of the question of history and, and you were studying all these scientists who had this sort of undergirding of Christianity, which sort of began to unsettle you. And then you had these interesting encounters with Peter Singer, where it sort of made you question some of the reasons for your ethics and morality and, and sort of unsettled you in that way. And then you say in the book that the kind of the third big thing for you was that your atheism was also failing me in another more mm. personal way. I mean, in what ways did you feel that your atheism wasn't satisfying that search for meaning? Because that was the other big thing for you, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, that's right. And this really, it's a kind of parallel thing, a kind of intellectual failure of atheism um, and a more personal failure as well, a sort of the failure of meaning, as it were. Um, I suppose that's because, as I sort of said in the beginning, I was always the kind of person um, who had life worked out as it were and for whom I suppose through a remarkable set of circumstances this kind of narrative that I told myself about what life was all about had always ha had been delivering as it were um but yet therein lies the irony that the more that those kind of dreams were fulfilled of going to Cambridge and going to Oxford and then publishing a book and but the irony of it is that the more success I was able to achieve the more it revealed that it was never enough. It just revealed another rung on the ladder, as it were. And that became fairly apparent to me around the same time because I stood sort of in my mid-20s having achieved what I'd always kind of thought would satisfy and I realised that it merely created another thirst, as it were, revealed another rung on the ladder. And so it meant that really even the kind of idea that we can create our own, even if there's no ultimate meaning in life, that we can create our own meaning. That is not a particularly robust understanding of life because there's clearly a kind of a desire that we have that regardless of how much we have is never actually satisfied. Um, and this is, I mean, this is a lovely kind of moment in which, you know, later when I started to read C.S. Lewis, um, he has that famous line about that if we, you know, if we find in ourselves a kind of desire, a yearning, a longing for something in which nothing in this world is able to satisfy, we can only conclude that we were in fact made, designed for um, another world. And that I think is really the best way of summarizing the kind of, yeah, you know, the existential kind of um, emptiness that that kind of secular humanism left me in. And the, you, there's a beautiful moment that you talk about in the book where you were in one of the Oxford libraries. Would you say just a little bit yeah. about that? Oh, because yeah, yeah. that was like, that was a really sweet moment and obviously quite a key point along your journey towards Christianity. Yes. Yeah. So I always worked, um, you know, creatures of habit as we are um, at the same desk in the college library. And one winter, um, you know, everyone goes home in winter. Um, and particularly those on the other side of the world, but I didn't that winter and I remained in Oxford and, you know, one particularly lonely afternoon in the library, I noticed that my usual desk had always been actually in, right in front of the rather extensive theology section. 
Um, and I'd never deigned to walk through those shelves, to be honest. Um, but that afternoon I did. Um, and I, I pulled off the shelves, a book of sermons. And I, I, to be honest, I expected to read the kind of the caricature of Christianity that I'd always had, which was that it was self-righteous, that it was pious, that it was vague, there was no genuine intellectual content. Now, of course, I, re I realise what an arrogant assumption that is, right? But I open this book of sermons and I begin reading and it's actually incredibly intellectually robust and profound. And moreover, the so the sermon is point, like pointing to a number of biblical passages, but the one that I remember in Psalm 139 is this idea that God created us, fashioning us within our mother's wombs. And I suppose that idea, to be honest, that that we were made and there's a kind of givenness to our existence and that actually, contra my very kind of millennial understanding that we invent our own lives in this kind of relentless search for self-creation, this idea that our existence and our dignity therefore might be given to us by God um, just was, was incredibly compelling. And from there, I sort of began to, I was still you know, very, um, critical and skeptical, but I began to read more and more. And what I found, the more that I read of the Bible, I mean, I, to be honest, I read theology before I read the Bible, but um, the more that I read, the more I realized that I had actually dismissed the entire Christian tradition that I thought that I understood. I thought that I knew, I sort of reduced Christianity, as many of us do, I think, in the contemporary West, to a series of kind of very... Um, very basic kind of doctrines or propositions and think that it is just this kind of simplistic series of beliefs. But actually, the richness of this story of God revealing himself to humanity, the kind of brokenness of humanity, the idea of God becoming flesh in the person of Christ and redeeming the world and its suffering, um, and, that, and that this, I mean, of course, appeals to me as a historian too, right, that this is actually part of a a whole story which makes sense of not only human experience on a personal level, but in fact of time, of history, that there will in fact be a kind of this, a fulfillment of time when Christ returns and sets all things right, as it were. That story that I you know, was a, a very long time before I'm learning about this and putting it together, but that story made profound sense of not only what I experienced in my own life, of the nature of human suffering and human longing, but also what I knew as a historian and saw of the world around me, of a world which is broken, um, a world which nonetheless yearns for a kind of lost Eden, um, yearns for a kind of perfectibility. Um, and yet in every kind of civilization and culture, and of course I you know, studied the, the history of ideas, um, attempts to kind of make in, in attempts to kind of create some sense of the good, um, particularly in the modern world, you know, trying to trying to perfect humanity and yet it sort of culminating in the 20th century genocides in many ways. And so this biblical story of the nature of humanity was making profound sense in a way that atheism never could, not least because atheism can't tell that kind of a story because there is no ultimate. We're all just here by accidents. Um, and that, yeah, the biblical story just is a far more compelling account of, of human life and of human history. Do you remember what that book of sermons was? Because it clearly set you on a really important part of that journey. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, it is, so the particular sermon, it's by a theologian um, with her, yeah, quite a philosophical theologian, um, part of the liberal Protestant tradition with whom I wouldn't really disagree, wouldn't really agree actually theologically at all. Paul Tillich, um, it was a sermon called You Are Accepted. Um, and it's interesting. I think, yeah, Tillich has some deep kind of um, theological um, theological problems. But I think what happened, I mean, when I kind of look back on that now as a Christian, because um, Tillich really influenced by kind of existential philosophy, I think what what God was using in that sermon was the fact that, of course, yeah, there are sort of glimmers of of truth there in what he was pointing to and pointing to the biblical passages. And so God used that to kind of um, open my eyes in a way that I think I've 
I wouldn't have actually had my highs. Um, I wouldn't have, I, different, different theologians, I think, wouldn't have resonated with me. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. For more shows, resources, and our newsletter, visit premierunbelievable.com.